So we're here at the Armtech Con uh, 2010, and you just had a fireside chat over here. Uh, and what did you talk about? I'll tell you, I sat in front of a fire. I'm not exactly sure what I talked about. But I will tell you, we, we went into a lot of interesting problems and a lot of challenges that the industry is facing. Uh, we talked about software, which is something we never talk about, but are starting to have to deal with. We talked about how software and hardware are going to work together. We talked about the economics of the entire industry and how we're going to change those underlying economics and what it's going to take. And, and I'll tell you what we ultimately decided is no single company is going to be able to solve this. Not one. There, there's not one company with the size and the strength and the breadth of solution that can solve this entire problem by themselves. What it's going to take is every company working together, doing their piece to change the way the, the industry economics work. So it's a very interesting balance between, uh, you were using the word differentiate often and, and collaboration somehow. So where does it, how does it work? How can you? So, so there's a, a whole new paradigm how we, how we have to work. And, and the word that I think explains it the best is cooperate. And, and what that means, what cooperate means to me, is that my company, Cadence, needs to focus on exactly what it is that we do that's of the highest value and the greatest differentiation to our customers and those other things that we do, that we have to do to complete our solution. We need to increasingly in rely on partners to provide those solutions and those partners may even be our competitors. And so it's new business relationships, new technology relationships are going to emerge in ways that have never happened before in this industry, where I will do what I do really well, and I'll relinquish the obligation to do what I don't do so well to other people in the supply chain and in our partner ecosystem that may do it a lot better than I do, and together we'll better serve the customer. And I know that people talk like this, and we've heard this kind of talk for years and years and decades and decades, but this time it's different. And it's different because the product cycles are cut in half, the cost equations are cut by a fifth, the quality requirements are increasing exponentially, and we can't solve this unless we as an industry work to solve it together. So, so do you think people will uh, agree to collaborate somehow? Is there an algorithm? How do you, how do you define which areas can be collaborative and which shouldn't? How, how, how do people just sit down and try and agree on that? Well, what's interesting, I've only been in EDA for a little over a year. I came from the software world, embedded software to be specific. And in the software world, it's very, very common that I'll provide the block or the, the IP that I do particularly well, and I'll work with a broad ecosystem. Open source is a very common working model in the software world is we all work together as an industry to provide a better solution to the end customer at a significantly lower price, at a higher quality point. And those principles that are so familiar and so common in software need to translate down to our industry. And the IP providers, the EDA providers, the foundry companies, the semiconductors are going to have to learn from the software world some of the basic principles that will enable us to deliver the complex products we have to deliver at a significantly lower price point. Nice. So there will be 500 TVs or even 400 TV, uh, HD TVs, and there will be $100 Android phones. There will be uh, cheap tablets. And somehow if the people involved can still make uh, a margin and profit. So how do you, you have to, re there's like, kind of like a disruption going on. No? So, so I love that you say disruption. Yes. The answer is yes. And, and $500, you know, high definition TV, I, I think, Two years from now, there's no way we'll pay that, right? The, the costs are, are coming down tremendously. And so if we don't disrupt the supply chain and rethink it and reconstitute it, we're never going to be able to deliver to what the end customer wants. And there are different regions, China, the Middle East, where we see they're willing to, to disrupt implement new business models and are delivering to these complex price points. So, so our industry has to learn 
from these great examples that are out there. Is that the first time you announced that you want to work with your competitors, or is, is it something that's on the process? When do you think it's going to... So the next stages of that. So April 27th, 2010, yeah. we published a industry vision paper called EDA 360, The Road Ahead. And in that document, which was a call to action for the entire industry, we stated our intention to collaborate with our industry partners, our industry competitors, in ways we haven't before. Now, a movement of this magnitude will take time to get momentum, to gain traction. We're going to have to work together to be able to do that. Um, it will take time, but I think it will happen. And that's something that ARM is used to kind of doing is uh, uh, when they work on, on trying to standardize Linux and Android and, and, and you were talking about trust, but that's something ARM does kind well, of. ARM's a shining example of a company that got a very robust, a very rich ecosystem of partners that know how to collaborate together and, and can help show us the way. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks. They're second 100% of revenue. So in a period of 18 months, they're continuously getting revenue until they pay for the device a second time. And again and again and again. And they don't care if I ever replace my device. And in fact, well, whether I do or not, it's irrelevant. They're going to continually make money on me. And so this whole complexity is being driven by device manufacturers can fundamentally change their business model. And not if they're a phone or a TV, but if they're an automobile or if they're a network switch. I, I did work with Huawei. And Huawei has become very, very competitive to Cisco. And what they did is they recognized people will pay for applications. Now, the applications aren't the applications you see on an iPhone. They're things like deep packet inspection or secure routing or high-speed offload. Those are network applications. But Huawei is charging an application model to their end customers, the, the um, carriers. And so they're getting a continuous revenue model. Cisco's getting a discrete revenue model. Who wins in this game? Huawei. Well, if it works in networking, it works in smart meters, and it works in the grid, and it works in missiles, and it works in airplane guidance system, and it works everywhere. I, I can't wait to see Lockheed come out with the whole application suite. You know, do you want to get this city or that city? Uh, on UQ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but what's very, very compelling is these new business models are driving different device types which are driving complexity that's coming and rolling down into everybody in this room. Mm -hmm. And while the device manufacturers are moving very quickly to embrace this new model, because there's a lot of incremental revenue on the line, we, as a, as a supply chain and an industry, struggle to keep up with that. So, somebody in this room will figure out how do we take advantage of a continuous revenue model that's being deployed by our device partners, customers, and implement that into our model so that we get those same benefits. That's the great idea. You can take back, you tell your boss, hey, we're going to move to a continuous revenue model because we're going to provide this new kind of value that's never been delivered, and we're going to get stinking rich, and poor arm and cadence will sit there. Actually, I thought your time-based licensing was kind of on that model. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in that department. Marketing. Marketing. You know, I mean, you, you're right, the, the, the advent of downloadable software, which we've been talking about for years. I remember kind of 10 years ago, we were thinking about ARM processors and running open operating systems and downloadable code and all the rest of that. You know, it's only really come, uh, be, become a reality in the last couple of years. And that has driven uh, just the need for more and more and more performance. And as much as we can deliver, somebody will think of something to do with it because the platform is open. Now, it also raises uh, a whole lot of concerns around security. The minute you start um, entertaining the concept that not all the software was in it when it left the factory, you have to suddenly worry about a whole new class of uh, security issues, particularly if you're uh, lucky designing nuclear weapons. Um, you know, you don't really want those things to be hacked. Um, which introduces a whole load of, load of challenges. Cause that have never been conceived, mm -hmm. have never been developed, have never been anything 
they'll come later, right? So Android's trying to be this extensible platform that has the makeup and the capability to enable applications no one's thought of. Well, so what does that mean? What that means is Android has to, to be predictable, reliable, extensible, a whole bunch of ibles. The important one to think about there is predictable. That means the APIs have to be unchanging at the layer where they reach up and touch the application. So what that means is they have to keep everything below equally predictable. So what that means is Android can't take advantage today of hardware differentiation unless it's brutally hard-coded. And it's a very, very complex hard problem that where Android touches the Linux kernel touches the hardware. And so what they do is they play to the lowest common denominator and they'll say, well, we know what the lowest common denominator is. We'll write to that. We'll write to that and make the software be really spectacular. But then what happens is every semiconductor company is sitting there and going, how can I really highlight the power and differentiation of what I have if the software says I'm going to play to the lowest common denominator? So there is a risk in this world of exploding applications and what it means to really deliver those. How do we, down in the semiconductor industry and in, in the system space as well, how do we differentiate ourselves? And so there's got to be work between all of us to figure out how can we allow Android to do all the things Android, the promise of Android, yet still allow us to take advantage of all the differentiation we want to do in the hardware. How do you make that happen? And there's a, a very, very difficult problem. How do we work together to get the software and the hardware to work together while still enabling us to highlight the differentiation that we have in our chip. And there's work. I am old enough to remember when Linux first put that noble cause out and there's very similar ideals. Um, what do they do tomorrow? What's different? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you look at the, the early days of Linux, it was you know, literally a guy in his bedroom who wrote this because he fancied doing it, I think. And, but put it out and got a lot of, uh, a lot of support there. Um, big companies aren't kind of minded to do that kind of thing generally. Um, you know, they, they look at where's this technology come from? Can I rely on it? Am I going to get sued by somebody else if I use it? You know, I think as an industry, you have to take a little bit more of, a, of an open attitude and, and take a hard look at, um, you know, what are the things I'm doing in my company that are truly differentiating? And what are the things that I can partner with somebody or, or go outside to get and, and reduce costs? Um, you know, clearly through last year, yeah, 2009 was a pretty horrible year for the world at large and, and certainly our industry. And lots of people did downsize. Now, that was a painful exercise to go through. But what's interesting to see is um, as the industry has rebounded through this year, uh, you know, revenues have gone up, profits have gone up a lot as well. I was at the SIA dinner the other night and the guy from uh, Deutsche Bank was showing some data and he looked at it and he went, that's impressive. You think about it for a moment and you realise that actually what the functions people removed during the downturn, they haven't replaced. They've delivered products and their profits have gone up. Well, that's actually quite a good thing because it does allow them to then fund more R&D instead of just funding people doing things that they shouldn't really be doing. So clearly there's a solution to it because people have delivered a lot of silicon over the last 12 months and you know, it looks like it's going to be fairly healthy growth in the industry through next year as well. Sure, so, so 2008, 2009 was really a flushing of the system and forcing people to start to take on some of these models, if you will, that we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. So it, it didn't take smart businessmen, it really took an act of God to cause us or force us to change an evil God. But <laughs> to, to do that. Yeah. yeah, now, you know, I wouldn't wish a recession on anyone. <laughs> but, it, but it did have the positive side effect of forcing people to think about the efficiency of their organizations. Um, yeah, 2010 has been a much healthier year for the, for the semiconductor industry. 2011 looks like this growth there, but I think, you know, for all of us, we do still have to keep thinking about the efficiency side of it and not go back to, you know, oh, the revenues are still growing, I can afford to grow my headcount enormously and it will be okay because, you know, one day there will be a downturn, you know, sorry to be uh, 
prophet of doom here, but uh, you know, I think we can look back at history and go, there is a downturn every so often. Our industry is horrendously uh, cyclical. Um, so it's going to happen again, and uh, it's better to be prepared for that than not prepared for it. So hopefully there's been a lot of learning through the last uh, year, 18 months, uh, and people will keep focusing on that efficiency. Because clearly there's got to be more that we can take out, more costs we can take out of the industry to allow it to, to prosper, to allow volumes to dry up. Uh, to, to dry up. I mean, and there are great examples in history of, of where when this kind of economic situation happens, they do strip out those costs where the collaboration we're talking about starts to, to happen and it becomes repeatable. Now, what's interesting is, you know, we've, we've talked about the TI arm cadence engagement on A15 um, because that's public and we're allowed to talk about it. But you and I know there's a number of repeat instances of this going on right now. And, and what has happened is we took the learnings from that first time through and applied them to be even smarter on the second, third, and fourth times through so that... Again, we get better efficiency in how do a semiconductor company, an IP company, and an EDA company work together to change the economics of how we can deliver a, a world-class, you know, great A15 core. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that there's some examples that we can see how this can work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly. Uh, I think the, that collaboration, that, that learning, um, and in general industry collaboration it kind of it accelerates how quickly new technology can be taken up by the industry at large. Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting to, to look at you know, some of the work we've done on, on the 32 nanometer and 28 nanometer work, for example. Um, again, not to, not to blow my own trumpet here, but you know, what, what we're trying to do is, is, is make, it, uh, make that technology, technology available to more people sooner. Right. Um, you know, typically, that sort of thing will be adopted by you know, the bleeding edge players, first of all, and years later, um, the mass market would come to that. Yeah, it'd actually be good for, I think, the world at large if more people took that technology on sooner uh, so we can get these, these cooler devices out uh, sooner and sooner. Um, so working together, proving out silicon, uh, the implementation, you know, trialing with uh, ARM processors, getting the EDA flows behind that, and setting everything up so somebody coming to a new design thinking, oh, 28 nanometer looks a bit scary, no, oh, actually, hang on a minute. These companies have worked together and solved that, solved the problems yep. before I have to. It's lowered my risk. It's lowering my costs. I can't afford to move to the next node sooner. Yep. And, that's and, and that's a great example, Simon. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, when I first joined Cadence, you know, 15 months ago, EDA um, long in the tooth here. So uh, that was one of the first major investments we did is how can we work with ARM differently than we have in order to work on those processes to get a 28 and 20 mm -hmm. and beyond so that, that the mainstream market can be competitive with those early bleeders who can follow crazy financial models. How can those guys that are more sane get involved? And, and that's a, a classic example of where we worked with you in a way we've never worked before to enable the market to, to adopt earlier than they had in the past.